Funding for the art show is made possible by Montgomery County Arts and Cultural District, the Virginia W. Kettering Foundation, proud supporter of the arts in our community, the Leslie Mapp Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. In this edition of the Art Show, scrap metal is transformed into community art. A daily practice takes on a life of its own. And sculpture that's rooted in origami. It's all ahead on this edition of the Art Show. Hi, I'm Rodney Veal and welcome to The Art Show, where each week we provide access to local, regional, and national artists and arts organizations. Our first segment takes us to Vandalia to check out Heavy Metal Remix, but it's not what you might think. This free event allowed the public to watch scrap metal get transformed from junk into community art, right out in the open for a very special park. Heavy Metal Remix was a symposium to build a steel sculpture from recycled materials at the city art park in Vandalia. We were looking for donations of metal pieces and they had to be magnetic and they needed to be steel and they needed to be heavy gauge and uh, since um, it's a reuse of scrap metals and materials the name of the event, Vandalia's Heavy Metal Remix, worked really well. I'm really not p particular about where it comes from, but more what it looks like and how it fits into my project. I am self-taught. I mean, I think I'm really good with proportions. I have a very good eye for what looks right. If I know I like it, I know someone else is going to like it. I started at about 13, maybe 14 years ago. What I do for a living, I trim trees, a little bit of landscaping and cutting grass, and my art has nothing to do with it. The only thing I take from my job into the art is what I see in the nature world, you know, the insects and trees and bugs and rocks, even flowers. I find myself trying to imitate what nature has created. Vandalia is the crossroads of America, where National Road and Dixie Drive intersect. Vandalia always has had people very interested in art. We have some strong artists that live in Vandalia. In 2001, we started Vandalia Cultural Arts, and in about 2007, we decided that since there was enough funding, we would like to give the community something that they can be involved in and results in a piece of public art. Vandalia Chiseled was a limestone sculpture symposium. So we had five artists that started with large blocks of Indiana limestone, and they were here for a two week period in 2010, and then we installed it in 2011. And so now we have five pieces of large public art on display in the city. Well, the art park is another thing that started several years ago. The Vandalia Art Park has two annual exhibits in it. One of them is a walking exhibit that has generally been photographs. The other pieces in the art park come to us from Midwest Sculpture Initiative and they're leased. And then they install them and deinstall them at the end of the year. And then we get a new series for the coming year. It's much more economical. We couldn't afford to purchase all of those pieces. So this works out very well, and our committee has decided that the changing of the pieces also brings people out and interest to the community. The first piece that went into the Vandalia Art Park was a piece done during the Sculpture Symposium. The second piece was purchased from Midwest Sculpture Initiative in 2015, and it's the Daddy Long Legs that sits to the rear of the park with its own landscaped area. 
And then the third piece was a community project, two totems that are about 13 feet tall that sit on the entrance to the park. We had 20 people make a piece of the totem and probably about half of the people were artists and half of them had never done anything like that before. So Doug Benedict's piece will be the fourth piece that's a permanent piece and owned by the city. So we hope to do that over the next few years where we own a piece every one or two years that fulfills the art park needs. I think it's some serious validation of your work that someone would think you're good enough to whether it's on a wall, anywhere, that in a public space. So as soon as they asked me, I was in. When I'm doing my art, it's the release. The rest of the world is zoned out, and you're just there in that moment. I really get focused. You lose track of time, everything. Mostly I do my art for myself, and I don't work on it at a blistering pace. I don't have a schedule when it has to be done. So that was really different for me. I didn't realize that art in that form is a job. I was up there for 10 days, and in the middle of it, I could really feel the weight of the project. You're concerned on how it's gonna come out. The volunteers that actually helped me were great. I, I never would have got done on time. But the volunteers really took instruction well and did it. A lot of grinding, some cutting on the bandsaw. We had to prepare the propane tanks and then holding parts together while I tacked them on. Oh! oh I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> I took some advice from a few people here and there. You do the side ones and then it naturally supports it. Especially on the construction of it, you know. I hadn't really had an idea until we got this cultivator. When we got the cultivator, I could see the legs of the caterpillar right there. I knew the propane tanks were going to be a big body. I think my favorite part of the sculpture would be the mouth. And I think some combination of this is going to be the eye. And I made like a mustache for it, so I have a sense of humor. <laughs> The community response was very positive. I think that's gonna be the antennae on it. I noticed a lot more people going to the art park every day on a general basis. We had a lot of involvement from volunteers. We probably had 50 different people that either acted as docents or Doug's assistants. So I think it's been really, really good. Plus we got a piece of art. The Vandalia Art Park is open to the public 24-7. It also joins a wonderful historical society property. So it is a regional destination. People come from out of the area to see both of those parks and I think it just is such a gift to the community. I think art is important to every community. We all work on streets and fire and police and we need a broader scope than that, and I think art brings that to us. Our kids love it, our kids love to express themselves with art, and it broadens us and makes us grow and be better. I think art is a way for people to express themselves in new and different ways. It's sad that it took me this long in my life to, to come to that, you know. I wish I could learn how to make a living off of it, a true living. It's tough and it's putting yourself out there. When I'm done with the tree business, it's my plan to pursue art more so than I am now. It really is. I tell people I'd love to get out of the destruction and go into the creation business because I'd rather create than destroy. And that's what art is, is creating. The Vandalia Art Park is open year-round. To learn more about the public and private art on display in Vandalia, visit the city's website or go to thinktv.org and click on the Art Show for details.
Up next, we meet Dayton artist Colleen McCullough. After a five-year hiatus from art making, Colleen created her first collage out of old magazine clippings and shared it on social media. This turned into a daily practice for her, and Colleen has now created and shared publicly a brand new collage every single day for more than three years. A lot of my work is funny. A lot of my work is weird. It's kooky. It doesn't really make sense. It's kind of jarring. And I like that aspect of work that surprises me and that I make things and I say, that's really creepy. That's really weird. When I create a collage, it feels like magic. I know that might seem really cliche. It is a process that is hard to describe. It is very intuitive for me. Most of the time I feel as though I am taking parts and pieces of an image that need to be together and finding a home for them. And because of that, I don't become too attached to the work. I tend to see it as something that exists in the world beyond me after I make it because these aspects of it existed in the world before me. Every day I get up, I sit at my desk and I make a collage and then I post them online. The pretty important part of my process is sharing them every day. It's kind of become a performative aspect of opening them up to the world and letting everybody see what's been on my mind that day. I love the practice of it. I love the process of it. I love sitting down and not knowing what's gonna happen and figuring it out. And I really like putting things together to make a larger whole. The process is very meditative. It's a time in which I can quiet myself and focus. And there's a lot of joy in that. The length of time that it takes, it varies from day to day. Some days it takes a half an hour, start to finish. Sometimes it takes eight hours. For a while, I was convinced that it would take however much free time I had. I have had a consistent daily practice for over three years now. I know that seems like a very long time in the span of a daily action, but it doesn't feel as though it's been that long at all. I think the biggest challenge is staying focused and staying committed because crazy things happen in life and I try and be very kind to myself and recognize that some days I'm gonna have work that I am more happy with than other days. So I started these daily intentional actions after I kind of went through a pretty big health struggle in my early 20s. Growing up I had a lot of pain in my legs and I was told that I would be in a wheelchair by age 25 and so I felt as though I had a timeline of things that I needed to accomplish before then. It was increasingly a painful experience and I ended up using a walker and wheelchair briefly for some of my college years until I found out that I had been misdiagnosed. I found out that I had been misdiagnosed with an illness um, that had really changed my life and my quality of life. It was extremely freeing and liberating to feel as though the world was open to me and at the same time it was extremely terrifying to not know who I was without that illness and that I think was a big transition. The realization that the world and the life that I thought I was going to have would be different set a different course to the way that I chose to live. So I just decided every day I'm going to do one thing, <laughs> no matter how big, and I'm going to just see where it takes me. I'm not going to judge it. I'm not going to apply any sort of critical eye to it. I'm just going to go with it and see what the collection of those intentional actions will, will be. It's never, it never ends. I could do this for approximately 1,000 collages. I explore a lot of different concepts and work through things in ways that I don't even realize until I kind of take a step back and look in retrospect at what I've done the previous weeks and months. Yeah, there's a lot of themes that I find recurring in my work. A lot of my work is figurative. There's a hybridization between nature, human, and technology. I'm very inspired by movement, by gesture, and I'm also very influenced by the female form and the way that it is used and fictionalized in media. I find myself 
interested in removing those from their context and recontextualizing them. And I think taking those images and kind of twisting them in a way that can be humorous and playful and really begin to speak about the way the images and media and the way that we interact with them is kind of the overarching theme of all of my work. The choice to share my work on social media is no mistake. I'm not saying I'm trying to change the world, but I'm very interested in the idea of using collage to begin to provoke thought, to subvert social media and these images that we kind of just mindlessly scroll through and mindlessly take in. I'm interested in creating something that creates a pause, creates a moment that maybe things seem a little off and it begins to open your mind to expand what else you see beyond that image. It is not that I am creating it, it is that for a time I get to allow something to happen and then put it out there and that is the most fulfilling part and the fact I get joy out of it is even better, you know, so that's it. Did you miss an episode of The Art Show? No problem. You can watch it on demand at thinktv.org. You'll find all the previous episodes as well as current episodes and links to the artists we feature. In our last segment, we traveled to Columbus to meet artist Yasue Sakaoka. She began folding paper as a child growing up in Japan, and today her artwork keeps the ancient tradition of origami alive with the modern twist. Yasue was named an Ohio Heritage Fellow by the Ohio Arts Council in 2007. Let's take a look. Origami is a very old technique of using paper to form really beautiful objects. And technically it's a folk art. It's something that you learn from your family and you pass down through the generations. My mother was a kindergarten teacher when she was young and single. And after she got married, she could not continue her work. So she had her own kindergarten with her children. And paper folding is one of the things we could do with her. Origami is written in two characters. That means folding paper. That has a very long tradition. It was perfected in late 18th century. It's a cultural thing. And there is a practice of folding 1,000 cranes to make a wish. And I remember at my grandmother's house, when she was going to visit Manchuria, Community people got together and made 1,000 cranes for her safe return, and it was hanging in her Buddhist's altar. In Japan, there's no real break between what is art and what is craft. We still have that division in the United States. Craft is considered a little lesser, and art is up here. In Japan, origami is art. A tea ceremony is art. So I think in Japan, it's much more important than it is here, traditionally. Yasue came to the United States to pursue a college education in sociology. But her creative side won out. I chose sculpture because of the humbleness of the material. I was looking for ideas. So I went into a small shop on the top floor of a department store in Tokyo, and they had a book called The Grandmother's Art, and I experimented with it, and I really grew on that one for some of my large paper installations. I think it's the geometricity of it. I was exposed to Buckminster Fuller's ideas, minimalism, many abstract ideas from the mid-20th century. The orientation is very geometric. There are some basic folds, and as long as you can manipulate a piece of paper to create different folds, which result in very rich planes, then you can be creative with it. 
Her work is based in origami, but it's also contemporary. Unlike traditional origami, she usually works in white, and a lot of her work is very large scale. It goes into the realm of sculpture and something that we call site-specific. It's designed to really fit the space, to go with the space, to complement it. It's also designed that the viewer has to interact with it. They have to walk around in it. And all this really goes back to the 70s, to minimalism, which was a movement that got artists away from having art tell a story. It's just about the form of the art and it's based on geometry and perfection, and I think that's why her work is so appealing to a lot of different people. It's exciting to walk with a given space. I have walked with a height of ceilings, 10 feet, some 20. And because of the material, it's possible to achieve that scale, and that can be very, very interesting to me. It's beautiful up close and it's really beautiful far away. And that's the genius of her work, is to take origami and then expand it into a large contemporary sculpture. A lot of times in a gallery, even though it's quiet, there's still air currents. And because her work is so lightweight and engineered, it moves a little bit too. And when you walk around it, you'll see the movement and you'll see it from different angles. So you have to interact with it. Yasue has taught at a high school for the creative arts, colleges, does workshops with young children, and works with apprentices. Yasue has had a lot of really wonderful apprentices over the years, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact she loves to teach, and she's a wonderful role model. But it's a very strong tradition in Japan, especially when it comes to the arts, and so Yasue has really kept that tradition alive too. They were eager. They also were interested to continue their art form in some ways. So it was just the right thing to do. And it grew into something very, very creative. I think she's a master because she's taken a very complicated traditional form, mastered it, Technically, she can do anything in origami, but then she takes it two or three steps in another direction. And that other direction comes through her knowledge of contemporary art and architecture. And so she's come up with a new form, but based really solidly in a very traditional craft. And that's why she's, she is unique. And that wraps it up for this edition of The Art Show. Until next time, I'm Rodney Veal, and thanks for watching. Funding for the art show was made possible by Montgomery County Arts and Cultural District, the Virginia W. Kettering Foundation, proud supporter of the arts in our community, the Leslie Mapp Foundation, the Ohio Arts Council, the Ohio Humanities Council, and viewers like you. Closed captioning, in part, has been made possible through a grant from the Iddings Foundation. Thank you.